good morning. My name is Joel, and I get to be the pastor here. And uh, real quick, I just want to publicly just thank John and the operations team. And will you join me in giving them a round of applause for doing? Yeah. It is hard to put into words how glad I am that I don't have to do that. So thank you, John, and thank you, just whole team that just does a great job uh, with all that. We're in a series called A Few of Our Favorite Things. In week one, we talked about church planting, and Trey Gilmore came and talked about Contrast Church in Grandview, and we, we planted the seed that this will not be the only church plant, that we've got 19 or 52 or something more to go. We're going to plant a lot of churches, and uh, we hope that you will, maybe some of you will even go on those church plants when the time is right. We talked about local impact. We talked about the block parties. We talked about wanting to get to know our neighbors and and wanting to continue to impact in the Gehanna, uh, impact the city of Gehanna. If our church left, they would actually miss us. Even the people that don't go to our church, we want them to miss us too because we have been a blessing to our city. And last week, it was the circus up here and we had our Three Creeks Kids Sunday. I loved it. I don't know if you did because you were sitting there with your kids, but I loved it. And uh, maybe we'll do that again sometime, but we love our kids. And man, if... This is what I said last week, and it's worth repeating that, man, if, if, uh, if we don't teach our kids to follow Jesus, the world will teach them not to. And so we're all in on Three Creeks Kids and making sure that they know that God is crazy about them. And today, uh, one of our favorite things, we love to give money away. As a church, we love to give money away. We want to be a recklessly generous church. We never want to be a- accused of holding on too tightly, but rather we might We'd rather be accused of being a little bit too loose, of being the beautiful fools that get taken advantage of even from time to time because we love to give money away. We want to be recklessly generous as a church and we want to be recklessly generous as people. I want to be a scratch your head, do they really do that, generous church. But the only way that giving money away becomes a favorite thing is if we don't believe that it was actually ours to begin with. Because if we believe that everything that we have, everything that we possess, if we believe that we own it, then giving it away is usually your least favorite thing. So it would fit into a different series entirely than our favorite thing. But when we look at the Bible and we look at the first church and we see how they interacted with what they had, with their resources, with their money, with their food, and you read the whole of scripture and you see whose everything really belongs to, then all of a sudden, it becomes a little bit easier to start giving it away. My kids illustrate this for me every day, maybe. Uh, The other night, we were over at Jordan and Liz's house for dinner. Uh, Jordan and Liz have a brand new baby girl, so she's got all these bows. And Willow, my daughter, is two, has a Sherlock Holmes radar for bows. Like, she loves bows. She will find any bow in any room that she's in. It took her about four minutes to find a bow that, had, that was on the floor in the toys, and she straps it on her head. And I said, Willow, you found a bow. And she kind of nodded yes. And I said, is that yours? And she nodded yes. And I said, I don't think so. And she said, mine. And I thought, okay, she says, mama, dada, and mine. Like these are the first three words. It reveals the sinful nature of a human, that the, uh, the first words that we learn are mine. And, and it's funny to laugh at a two-year-old, but in our adult ways, don't we do the same stuff? When something that we think that we own, that we deserve, that belongs to us is threatened or taken away, we go, that's mine. And that I love you, but that is a misunderstanding of whose everything is. When we believe that everything is ours, it becomes incredibly difficult always to give it away. But when we know that it's not, when we believe that everything belongs to God, life gets more fun because you get to live a little bit more open-handedly. Did you know that 72% of you are either moderately or extremely stressed about money. 72% of the room is, would it put themselves in the category, of, I'm either moderately or extremely stressed about money. So that's most of us. And the tendency for those people is to think, well, the other 28%, they, 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 just, might, they just have so much money that they don't need to be stressed about it anymore. 
That's our first thought. But if you really think about that, you and I both know that that isn't true. That is not true. The 28% of people who aren't stressed about money don't just have more. In fact, some of the stuff, some of the, I've had a couple interactions recently where I'm like, I don't know if I want more money because it seems like the people that have a lot more money are way more stressed out about it than I am. They're paranoid. They're worried about a lot of stuff. They try to keep it intact and who's going to get it. And it actually stresses them out even more. We are all, we all know that getting more is not the secret to jumping from the 72% to the 28% of people who say, I feel financially free. That's not the answer. More isn't the answer. There was a study done in the Reader's Digest. They, they interviewed a bunch of people, 100 people per category, people that made $20,000 a year. And they said to them, what is the number that you need to get to so that you would feel financially free? And the average answer of those who were making 20,000 said, if we could just have 45,000, that would be what we need. And they went and they interviewed 100 people that made 45,000. And they said, what would be the number that you would need to be at so that you could feel financially free? And they said, 75,000. And they interviewed 100 people at 75,000. You kind of guess where it's going? Guess where it's going? 125,000. That was the answer that they gave. And so the secret from getting from 72, the 72% to the 28% of feeling strapped and stressed to feeling financially free, it's not getting more money. It's being generous. The secret of the 28% is that they're generous. The secret of the 28% is that they don't look at what they have and go, mine. They look at what they have and they go, thine. See if you can follow me here. Thine is a real old Bible word, I think, that a lot of people use to, when, when they're attributing something that God owns. So like in the Lord's prayer, it says, thine is the kingdom and thine is the power and thine is the glory. It is thine. It is yours. It's capital T, thine. And the way that our church wants to operate as a church and as individual people is not taking what we have and going, this is mine, but looking at what we have and going, this is thine. How can I use it for thine? How can I use it for God? How can I use it for other people? Because I have been given this to use, to be a blessing and to do it wisely. I've not been given it to keep and hold it for myself. When David, uh, King David was writing in Psalm 24 about ownership and about who owns everything, David writes this. He says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. And then when God is speaking in Psalm 50, God says, for all the animals of the forest are mine and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, God says, I wouldn't even tell you. For all the world is mine and everything in it. I don't need you to feed me. I could feed myself. I can eat it all. If I told you I was hungry, I wouldn't even, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you because I own everything. And my dad, as I was growing up, he would, when he was teaching me about money and, you know, maybe he would say, you know, here's your allowance for the next six months or whatever. And he's kind of helping me navigate finances and ownership. He would put his arm around me and he would read me this. He would read me Psalm 50. That when God says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. My dad would say, Joel, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Then he'd nudge me and he'd go, and he owns the hills too. He owns the hills that all the cattle are on. And his, it was his way of saying, it is all his. Every pride of lions is God's. And every head of cattle is God's. And every chicken that's alive and every Chick-fil-A sandwich is God's. And anybody in here that owns a diamond ring, that was forged in God's mine in God's earth. And everybody who owns a pearl, that pearl was made in God's oyster in God's ocean. And everybody in here with a wallet and paper money, it's just a couple of you. That paper was made from God's trees in God's forest. 
Every car, every home, every iPhone was made with everything that God made. It's his. It's all his. Here's one for you. The 10% that some of us are tithing to our church, that is God's. And the 90% that we kept, that is God's. It's all God's. So you might be tempted to think, well, 10% is a lot for him to ask back. It's all his. It's actually a pretty generous move on his part to be like, yeah, just a little bit. It's all his. Everything is God's. We are not owners. We are caretakers. And when we believe this, actually at our core, when we hold all that we own and everything that's in our bank accounts and everything that's in our garages, when we hold it all like this and go, this is not mine, it is thine, it changes the way that we behave with it. Think about it this way. If I told you, that you got $10,000. But I told you, you know, there's two different ways that you got it. The first way, imagine this, is you get a bonus. You have worked well and you have worked hard and you have, in your mind and in your company's mind, you have earned it. So you get a $10,000 check. It is deposited in your account, yours. Okay, that's one way. The other way, somebody gives you a gift. $10,000 $10,000 check and has a conversation with the gift that goes, hey, I want you to use this and I want you to use it wisely and I want you to use it to be a blessing to other people. And in 30 days, I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you what you did with the $10,000. The question is, the question is this, would you spend those two $10,000 differently? And if the answer is yes, and frankly, it is for me, I've got to think about this. If the answer is yes, then that means that we think that we own the first one. We think it's mine, not thine. We think we earned it. We think we got it. It's ours to play with or do what we want with. But, but when it comes with these strings attached, it's like, okay. But the reality is, is that every dollar in our accounts is really like the second one. It's the one with the note attached that says, use it wisely and be a blessing. It's God's way of, or the the little, like, I'm going to come home, or I'm going to come back in 30 days and kind of check in. God sees everything. It's not, he's not even waiting 30 days. He sees everything that we're doing with everything that he's given us. It, it, he's holding us accountable. We will give an account to what we did with what we got. And everything that we have is not mine. It is thine. It is his. This is a really hard way to live. It's a hard place to get to. I, let, me, let me rephrase that. This is a very hard place to get to, but it's a great way to live. It is challenging to get to the point where we start living with everything that we own like this. This is not mine. It is thine. What do you want me to do with it? But once we get there, it's the best. It's the best life. Let me, uh, I kind of said this already, but I should say it again. We want to be this kind of church. Like when we look at our whole budget, when we go through the meeting of the minds and everything that John shared, even in that, we want to live like this. And we want to be full. We want to be individual people that do the same. And I do want to take a minute briefly here to encourage you to encourage you that you are among a people that is recklessly generous. Maybe not every person to a man or to a woman, but man, there are some pretty wildly generous people in this church. And I want to, I want to tell you a couple stories of things that I've heard just in the last couple months that I think that you will go, no way. That sounds like a, it's not mine, it's thine mentality. In February, I got a phone call from somebody in our church. It was right after the mindset series that we did in January. You guys remember this? We had talked about counseling. We had talked about talking with people. We talked about being there for people. And this person said, I feel like God is putting it on my heart to, don't tell him I told you this, but to tell Brandon Durfler that we my family wants to pay for him to go to counseling. And I don't know how much they cost. I think I kind of have an idea. So we'll do six sessions of counseling for Brandon. I said, Brandon has to work with me every week. He's going to need 12 sessions of counseling. 
<laughs> no, I said, I said, I've been talking with Brandon for months about how he feels like that would be such a gift to him in his life that he, would, that he does need to process some stuff that he was going with, with some of his past. And every time it came up, the cost was a barrier. It was like, I know I need it, but I don't know how much it costs and I don't want to pay. That There's a barrier there. And this person stepped in and says, I don't care what it costs, six sessions, let's do it. Don't tell him I gave it to you. So I get to call Brandon and say, Brandon, you're not going to believe this. I love you. You already knew that. But so does somebody else. So much so that they're wanting to do this. And that, that is a, it's not mine, it's thine. Who can I bless mentality? The next day, the next day, I was on a, I was actually traveling back from a trip with a couple friends. And on this trip, we were talking about marriage. We we're talking about life, talking about kids, talking about real deep things. These are good friends. On the way back, we were driving back and I wasn't, uh, I was just with one other of the guys in the car and I brought up another person that was with us and I just said, hey, it just feels like marriage counseling for them would, be, would not be an offer that they would turn down. It just seems like they're in a season with young kids and just things don't seem easy and he was vulnerable enough to share that with us. It feels like if we kind of rallied together, then maybe we could, uh, we could help them. And I don't think they'd say no to that. And then of course, the same question Brandon had. It's like, ah, we're gonna pay for that. You know, <laughs> like me or you. And, uh, and so we kind of, we shelved it and we said, hey, let's, let's talk again tomorrow. Let's see what we can come up with and see what we can do. 30 minutes, that was at 1 p.m. At 1.30 p.m., 30 minutes later. I, I actually, I'm not trying to, sensationalize a story in the conversation in the car at 1 p.m. I thought, I just, I don't know. I just hard to put words to it. I just felt like something was going to happen. And at 1.30, I get a text. Hey, we feel led by God to donate $400 to somebody in or connected to our church to go to counseling. We don't know who it is. They would have had no clue that this was going on. We want to give $400 because we know that's what God wants us to do. We don't care who you give it to. Just figure out who needs it. And I, so I, I, yeah, I don't know if I called or texted back, but I kind of explained the story. I said, you're not going to believe, I did call him. I said, you're not going to believe this. I, I told the whole story about, you know, half an hour ago and, and okay, wow, that's, you know, time, the timing is crazy, whatever. And then he texts me back 10 minutes later. He said, doesn't seem like 400 is enough. We'd like to give a thousand bucks. And I'm just going like, so I get to call these friends and say, hey, you already know that we love you, but so does somebody else. Somebody that hardly even knows you wants to pay this for you. That is a, it's mine. It's not mine. It's thine mentality. And then three weeks ago, we're taking a bunch of people to Africa here in uh, September. And these people are raising money to buy the plane tickets to get to go on the trip. And it's kind of expensive and uh, Jeff, I'm just going to out you. Here he is. Jeff's going on the trip and Jeff's raising money. Jeff's hustling. Jeff's raised a bunch of money, but he hits this wall and he's got $1,900 to go. And you're questioning, you're like, you know, God wants you to go on the trip, but you're questioning how in the world that's going to be possible. And you are at a point where you're like, I don't know if I can go. And you're praying about it. And you walked out to me after church and said, you're not going to believe this, but somebody in our church just gave me $1,900 because they found out about this trip. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, this is probably somebody who's established in their career. They've got $1,900 to spare. They're just, it probably didn't. I mean, if somebody's given $1,900, that's a lot of money. That probably didn't hit them that hard. Come to find out it's somebody who's single, just starting their career. And that is a lot of money. And I was just blown away by this person's generosity. A person who wanted to go on the trip themselves, who reaches out and says, I can't go because of family and work stuff, but God wants you to go. I'll pay for that. What? So I have to reach out to this person and figure out how in the world they got that way. So I, I said, uh, I said, what in the world? What happened? Like, why would you feel so compelled to give? And I just, I can't not read it. This person responded, 
I gave your question some more thought. What prompted me to give? A few months ago, somebody gave me the book, Crazy Love. I tried reading it, but it just wasn't clicking. Last week, I tried picking it up again and flew through it in three days. There were several parts in my book that prompted me to stop and think about how I'm living. For most of my life, my faith has been lukewarm. I'd pray and do what I was supposed to do, but if things didn't go how I planned, I'd get frustrated. Over the past few years, I've been learning to trust God, to be open with Him about my desires and live with more dependence on Him, knowing that His way is always best in the end. And here's what I learned from the book. Here's the four things she wrote me. Faith has to be all or nothing. You can't be lukewarm. Number two, seasons, are, seasons of giving are the most rewarding. Number three, think of every person you come in contact with as Christ, even if the person cuts you off in traffic. Amen. Number four, how will you respond when God asks, what did you do with what I gave you? I said, when can you preach? Can we just do that some Sunday? She writes, God has blessed me in a number of ways. It is easier to live for myself and focus on the things I want in the future, a house, a car, kids, etc. But it's too easy. Over the last year or so, God has provided everything I truly needed in perfect timing. It doesn't always look exactly how I envisioned, but most of the time it's what I need. This is her last sentence. By giving money, I feel like I'm living actually depending on him. I actually feel like I'm depending on him. A lot of us, let's be honest for just a second. How often do you feel like you are actually depending on God? When we get in these moments where we are depending on God, when he has to come through, that is when faith grows, solidifies, is proven as genuine. It's when we put ourselves in places where we actually need God to come through. And one of the ways that we can do that is we can be more open-handed with our money and our stuff. We can give more of it away, put ourselves in a place where we go, man, that was like too much. I don't know if we're gonna be able to cover what we have to cover because we gave it away. She gets, by giving money, I feel like I'm living actually depending on him. That is what it's not mine, it's thine looks like. And that's the kind of stuff, that's the kind of life that I want to live. I mean, I heard that and go, wow, that is further than I've gone recently. I want to depend on God. If we believe it's mine, it will always be hard to give away. But if we believe that it's thine, it starts to get really easy and really fun to give it away. I want to tell you one more story. I'm a little nervous to tell you because it's borderline irresponsible. But on the, <laughs> but on the same side, on the, on the same uh, time, it actually maybe is the most responsible thing. If we hold that it's not mine, it's thine, and we believe that is true, then, it's, then, then I'm really proud to tell you this story as a church. Because in a lot of ways, you're a part of this story. I didn't get your approval before it, but here we are. Um, so when we planted our church a couple years ago in Goshen Lane Elementary, a lot of people gave us money for different things that we had to buy at the beginning. One of those things was a stage. We had to buy that stage. Everybody remember putting that thing together? Man, I'm so glad we don't have to put that together. And it was brand new. It was about $7,000. It's pretty expensive, but that's what it costs. Well, that stage had been sitting in those sheds at Goshen Lane for like two and a half years. And we were just kind of holding on to it because we thought it was worth money, I guess. And it, and it was, and it is. And uh, then there's another church plant over in Dublin that uh, they got kicked out of their space like five weeks before Easter. And they were working hard and they, they found this other space that they were going to try to renovate so that they could kind of relaunch their new church that had just launched in a new space on Easter Sunday. And I had talked to these guys and had prayed with these guys and encouraged these guys before. And they text me and they said, hey, uh, here's a list of things that we're looking for. 
And on this list is a stage. And I'm like, well, we got a stage, you know? So I, you know, we got a stage and okay, well, what is it? And take pictures of it. How big is it? Okay, so we do all the stuff. And, and they say, what are you thinking price-wise? I'm like, ah, you know, 7,000 bucks, brand new. We used it 120 times. I don't know, 3,000 bucks. And I felt generous. <laughs> I felt like I was giving him a good deal. 3,000 bucks. And he writes back, he goes, man, is there anything maybe we could trade f- with you with? Like, we've got this stuff, but we don't have that kind of cash, and we're trying to pull this thing off. Is there anything we can do? And I'm sitting there, and I just thought, man, it, God brought to mind the fact that somebody gave us that stage. <laughs> somebody paid for us to have that stage. And here I was, fingers clenched around this stage that was collecting cobwebs in a shed that we're never going to use. And I felt God saying, come on, Joel, is it mine or is it thine? You know, like, like whose is the stage? And I had this picture of somebody preaching about Jesus on top of this stage. And then my mind went to this stage all folded up in the corner of our shed. And I just thought, which one honors God more? If it's in the shed or if it gets preached on an Easter Sunday about the resurrection of Christ. And they couldn't afford it. So I said, it's yours. It's yours. What are we going to do with it? It's yours. We gave it away. And I was like, ah, should I have done that? And I thought, yeah, I should have done that. I should have done that because it's thine, not mine. And not ours. And we never got that $3,000. And then I read in Proverbs eleven twenty five that a generous person will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And this verse, before I tell you the rest of the story, has been taken out of context over 5 billion times. And it's misinterpreted so many times, they can't even count it. But I read it and I thought, wait, does that mean it's coming back to us? Does that mean that, you know, we gave the stage, somebody's going to give us a $500,000 ministry center? Is that what's coming our way? Because he who refreshes others, he himself will be refreshed. Is this how it goes? Well, let me tell you the end of this story, but you got to hear me all the way to the end because I want to make sure theologically we are so spot on on this. One week after we gave this, and and let me just say this too. As we gave the stage away, we're also trying to buy a trailer and we're trying to do some other stuff. So $3,000, it has, it, it carries with it like cost. And the thought that was in my mind when I was thinking about giving it away is what is this gonna cost me? What am I going to lose here? But the question that God brought to my mind in the moment is, what is it going to cost you, Joel, if you don't? What are you going to miss out on if you don't? Because what I have in store for you might be better than 3000 bucks. Stay tuned. I just had this, I'm not counting on it. It's not a promise like that. It doesn't work like, exactly like that. But I just had this feeling about it. So I go, it might have been three days later. It was certainly within the next week. I went to Cohatch which is where our staff has memberships. It's a co-working space. We don't have an office, but we all kind of work in the main area and and we love it. And it's been a blessing to our church and we have meetings there and stuff. And I went to the uh, person who was working there and I said, hey, things that uh, are church budget-wise are just a little tight right now. And if there's, there's, we got to make a couple cuts and I'm just really sorry, but we're going to have to cancel our memberships. And uh, yeah, we're going to really miss you guys. Okay, you know, so we signed the papers, cancel in 30 days. Okay, so I'm thinking I got 30 days. I'm going to drink so much coffee. They're, I mean, whoo, I'm going to take maximum, maximum from them as I possibly can in these 30 days. So then the next day, I, uh, they, they said, hey, have you ever applied for the, the, the nonprofit scholarship? I said, I didn't even know there was one. And they said, well, you should apply. So I get on there and I apply and uh, I get the email back that says, we review these on July 1st every year. I'm like, well, that doesn't do me much good. This is like in March. And I was like, well, okay, whatever. I'm, we're not, I'm just going to be working from home or Panera or whatever. And uh, I get an email the next day 
congratulations. Uh, Cohatch has reviewed your application, and we'd like to gift your church $5,000 for your whole staff to have memberships for the whole next year. And it, you know, it just brought to my mind immediately this thought I had before that was, what am I going to lose if I give this away? And then God saying, see, I'm telling you, would you just trust me for a minute? I own everything. And let me be so abundantly clear about this. When Proverbs says that a generous person will prosper, that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed, let me be so clear that the scholarship from Kohatch was not the blessing that's in in that verse. That the $5,000 that came back, which was more than the $3,000 that we gave, that is not he himself will be refreshed. That is not it. The promise here was already fulfilled when we gave it away, because what this verse means is that he who refreshes others, he who is generous to others, in that act, that person is actually being refreshed as they do it. It's not wait for it to come back for you. The refreshing is in the refreshing of others. Has anybody experienced this before? Where you're going to take a meal or mow somebody's lawn or just do something for somebody else or give something to somebody else, do you, do you know that like it's actually the giver that gets more than the getter? It's the generous person that is actually refreshed in the refreshing of other people. And if you don't believe me, just try it just a little bit. Just do, it, just do something different. This week, giving is actually the most refreshing thing. The Kohat Scholarship, that is the favor of the Lord on our church, but it's kind of the cherry on top of the verse. That's not what the verse means. The verse doesn't mean that if we give this money away that it's going to come back to us. It's not what it means. This verse means that in the giving of it, that in and of itself is refreshing because it's a lot better to live like this than it is like this. It's better for the soul to know that it's not mine. It is thine. And when you give stuff away, it proves it that you don't believe that it's yours. My hope, my hope is uh, if you take what John said about our budget and you look at the paper that you, you were handed on your way in here and you hear what I'm sharing about like the heart of our church to want to give money away, we have a line item in that budget called generosity and that is money that we just give away. And I can tell you story after story after story of this whole year of getting to just give money away and help people. I hope that if you take what John said when I'm sharing in that paper, that deep in your soul, like deep inside of you, that you would know that our church loves to give money away. That we want to have, we want to have a, it's not mine, it is thine mentality as a church. And so from time to time in the future, I'm just telling you now, we're going to do things that do not appear fiscally responsible. But we would love to do things that are kingdom-minded and kingdom-hearted, believing that it's what God wants us to do. We want to be crazy generous as a church and as individual people. And I'm asking you as my brothers and sisters in Christ, as my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm asking you, is God wanting you to just give more to our church? And as you do it, would you, would you give it in a way that you don't necessarily see it as giving to our church, but giving through our church? Trusting in our operations team and our elders and, and trusting in the people that are spending a lot of this money. Will you see it as a way for you to show God that you want to be like this, not like this? And I'm hopeful And I'm prayerful. I was thinking about this even this morning as I was finishing up writing these notes at the end. I just thought, man, I hope that they would know that if they do, that there is no guarantee that something's coming back to them. But that if they do, if they they open their hands and go, I will give more than I usually do, than I ever have, that that in and of itself, that that act would actually refresh your soul. And you would go, man, what took me so long? What took me so long? This is the best life. I'm I'm not in the 72% anymore. I'm in the 28%. I am so, I am free from this when I live like this. 
I hope that you experience all these things. But more than all that, here's the last thing I'm going to say. More than all that, I'm hopeful that everybody in the room could stop for a minute and think for a second about how unbelievably rich you are. And I'm not even talking about money and houses and cars. Like we're definitely very rich. Like we're, I don't know the stats. We're like what, top 2% or something crazy like that? Like we're loaded. We are absolutely loaded. But that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the most valuable, lavish gift that has ever been offered to you. And this is the overwhelming, unbelievable grace of God on your life. Stop and think about it for a second. Because this money stuff is a tool and it's important. And Jesus talks about it a lot and how we handle it. God's watching. Like all the things I said is important. But before we get there, can we talk about our most valuable resource that puts all the money we could ever have to shame? This lavish, unbelievable, amazing grace of God that every sin that I've ever committed is forgiven and paid for? Do you know how much sin costs? Sin costs life. The wages of sin is death. And so without this generous gift of God, I'm in trouble. It's over. It's hard to put a price on life, and that is what is at stake. And Jesus says, I'm coming, and I'm paying for it. And I'm giving this as a gift. Nobody has earned this. You couldn't earn this. I'm giving it as a gift. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, look at this verse. He says, you know, the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. We are loaded. We are loaded with the thing that matters the most in this life. And the thing that matters the most in this life is the forgiveness of our sins and the grace of God on our heads. And so whether you walk out of here with a million dollars in your bank account or $10 in your bank account, doesn't matter. We're just equally loaded if we have accepted this free gift of grace from Jesus. And so to just talk about money on a Sunday morning would just be a tragic mistake if we did not acknowledge that the gazillionaire that is God in the currency of grace has given us more than we can handle. And that is amazing. It is amazing. We're actually gonna sing a song called Amazing Grace. This is amazing grace. And as we sing it, I hope that we will just have this posture of gratitude of like, holy smokes, look what I have. Not, man, I hope I get that. Because the list of things we have is exponentially longer, exponentially longer than the list of things that we think that we need. We are rich in Christ. Before we sing, we're actually gonna take communion. We do this once a month as a church family. Uh, If you are a Christian, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you would raise your hand and said, I'm in, I'm a Christ follower, then communion is for you. If you're still on the fence and if you're not sure and if you're checking things out, then communion is is reserved for a later time for you, hopefully after a moment that you choose to follow Jesus. But we ask that if if you're still checking things out, that you would just kind of stay where you're at. But if you're a Christian, this is pretty, pretty special and pretty powerful moment to go and remember what Christ has done for us. So when you go take the bread and when you take the cup, don't do it quickly. Don't do it without thinking about it. Take it, close your eyes, and think about the fact that we're loaded, that we are so rich because of Christ and what he did on the cross. And then take it, and and the actual, the act of taking it, the act of putting it in your mouth, that is you once again receiving this truth, reminding yourself of this truth that we are so rich in the grace of God and we didn't earn it. He did it for us. Let me pray for us. 
God, with all that we have, we want to be generous to you and generous to others. We praise you for the, the grace of God that we cannot put a dollar amount on. We've been given life and life to the full through Jesus. And so we stop and before we figure out how to handle 500 bucks or a thousand bucks this week, before we pray about that, we just want to stop and just be full of gratitude and full of thankfulness because you've given us all that we need. Our sins are washed away and that is amazing. And so, Father, as we take communion, we're not going to take this in remembrance of all that we have to do this week or all we forgot to do last week. We're not going to take it remembering mistakes. We're not going to take it remembering sin. We're not going to take it remembering shame. We're going to do this in remembrance of you and what you have done for us to eliminate all of those things from our life. And so I pray for the person in here who just needs a connection with you this morning that they would get this right now that in the next five minutes as they take communion that you would refresh their soul just drop some grace on their life and remind them that they are rich in christ thank you in jesus name amen